Good morning and welcome to all of you again, our members and our visitors. Uh, as we record ahead of time, as we have uh, the last several weeks, we're glad to have all of you here. Uh, we've noticed a number of uh, visitors on our site and we are especially glad that that's happening. Uh, we hope, and I'll say more about this in a minute, we hope and think this is the last Sunday that we'll have to record ahead. First of all, though, I wanna give you a, a pastoral update on uh, Joelle and Logan. Uh, she is still in physical therapy rehab at Baptist DeSoto. She says that she's doing better very gradually. Uh, she may come home this Thursday, but that's not certain yet. Then in addition, uh, probably some of you, but not all of you know, especially because of the distancing, um, Jimmy Cahill had a bad fall just uh, several days ago, uh, broke his arm between the elbow and the shoulder, and, and because of his overall condition beforehand, they're not going to be able to do surgery. He really is laid up literally at home right now, 24-hour uh, help. Uh, Trish, Pat is doing what she can, but we obviously want to include the Cahills and Joe in our prayers. As I said, we are expect, we've got the new air conditioner being installed. We are expecting that we will be able to finally gather as a congregation next Sunday. Uh, we'll certainly uh, inform you that that is going to, in fact, be the case, but we're expecting to do that. Then one more thing, after the service today, uh, we have the privilege and the honor of administering the sacrament of baptism to John Flynn Monteith, who is the infant child of Scott and Meg Monteith. We will be doing that here this morning, as I say, and Lana Nail will be uh, representing the session. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is a day at which Jesus declared, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let us worship God. Let us pray. God of all glory, on this first day, you began creation, bringing light out of darkness. On this first day, you began your new creation, raising Jesus Christ out of the darkness of death. On this Lord's day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the Spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your great glory. Through Jesus Christ, in communion with the Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever. Let us come now into our time of a confession of our sins. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is slow to anger and completely faithful in his steadfast love. The Lord is near to those who are brokenhearted and saves those who are humble in spirit. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us. We rejoice in the gifts you have given us. Yet we confess we do not always use them to glorify you. For using the gifts of your spirit for selfish gain, 
instead of using them for the common good, forgive us, O oh God, for avoiding your call to be witnesses for Christ, not that you have given us gifts for your service. Forgive us, O oh God, for hoarding and wasting our gifts, ignoring that we each build up the body of Christ. Forgive us, O oh God. Spirit of the living God, melt us, mold us, fill us again with your power, and use us for your word, so that our lives may glorify you. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Jesus took on our sins and the sins of the whole world and bore them in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and alive to God. Believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Our responsive reading today is from uh, Psalm 104, verses 24 through 35. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is a sea, vast and spacious, seeing creatures large number, living things both large and small. <laughs> there the ships go to and fro, and from Lithium, that you have formed a product there. All creatures look to you to give them their food and fire time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and encourage to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. They glory the Lord of your command. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, it touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the living be no more. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. Our New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Caphalia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, 
and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our gospel passage this morning comes from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, reading verses 19 through 22. The sermon this morning will be on the passage that Jenny just read for us in Acts 2, the sort of quintessential Pentecost passage. This passage uh, in John we heard some of a few weeks ago. It's not as explicit as uh, Luke's version in Acts, but this is in a sense John's version of Pentecost. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where, where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then his disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Amen. As I prepared this Pentecost Sunday uh, this year, I looked back at the sermon that I preached on Pentecost Sunday in 2011. On that Pentecost, we were confirming the confirmation class that morning. You have any guess who they were? Maggie Ross, Wes Gibbons, and Anthony Rowley. You've come a long way, babies. In the sermon that morning, I twice quoted one of the commentators on this Pentecost passage in Acts 2. And he said these words. He said, a Christian is a person in whom something extraordinary, is an ordinary person in whom something extraordinary has happened. A Christian is an ordinary person in whom something extraordinary has happened. And right after that, he said, the Holy Spirit has descended on each one of us and given us the power to speak the truth in Jesus' name. I want to repeat that too. The Holy Spirit has descended on each one of us and given us power to speak the truth in Jesus' name. I remember that at that point in the sermon that Sunday in 2011, I looked at Maggie and Anthony and West, and I said to them, I want and I hope Maggie and West and Anthony, that you'll think about what those words mean for you. And then I added, I remember, but this morning, we all need to hear what they're saying to us. Can we grasp that? Every Pentecost, where we're sort of challenged to grasp the message, can we take that into our heart? We are those ordinary people in whom something extraordinary has happened. And it starts at Pentecost. In one of her books, the Episcopalian minister and author, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, writes, if you believe the Bible, then there's no better proof that Jesus was who he said he was than the before and after pictures of the disciples. Before Pentecost, before Pentecost, they were dense, timid bumblers who fled at the least sign of trouble. After Pentecost, they were fearless, fearless leaders. They healed the sick, they cast out demons. They went to jail gladly where they sang hymns until the walls fell. And she says, how did this transformation come? 
She said, you can read all about it in the book of Acts. And she goes on. The last thing Jesus told his disciples to do before he ascended into heaven, and of course we celebrated Ascension Sunday last week, the last thing he told them to do was to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for God's promises to come true. He told them that they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. They did as they were told. They went back to Jerusalem, and they did not have to wait a long time for the answer to their prayers. On the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place, and they got a crash course in power. I want to focus for a minute there on that power that came from the Holy Spirit on all those believers at that first Pentecost. I guess really better put, I want to focus on the transition of power, the passing on of power to those believers from Jesus at that first Pentecost. <clears throat> Pentecost is the last great and mighty act of God in what I'm going to call a sequence of three mighty acts in Luke's account of Jesus' resurrection and then what followed. The first act is Easter morning itself. God raises Jesus from death by the power and the spirit of his power. And now this, the once dead Jesus becomes the risen Lord, the living Lord. Act two is that for 50 days after Easter, as we know, the risen Christ lived among those disciples and among those other believers, and he spoke to them and he ministered to them in many ways, but he makes it clear all the time that he's not going to be there long. And then he ascends to heaven to be with the Father. And that brings us to today. The third mighty act is what the scriptures tell us about today. Pentecost. This is a unique and distinct and powerful moment. God comes crashing down, and, and God comes crashing in not to do damage, but to fill those believers with new life that he's giving them through the Holy Spirit. At that moment, this great transition happens. The power of God that raised Jesus from death, that same power, and the Spirit of the living Christ are now all given to those followers of Jesus. It's right there among in that, in that passage that Jenny read. For one place, it's in verse 21, which says, Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now they're united. They become one. They become <clears throat> one family. And the Holy Spirit sets that family, sets our family on one mission. Listen to these words on one mission, on one calling, that in everything we will be witnesses to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in that same moment, another thing happened. Our family got a name. And our family name is the church. From that first moment on, our family and each one of us in the family has the spirit of Pentecost Within us, as amazing as that sounds, we have the spirit of Pentecost within us, but not to keep it within us. We're supposed to carry that spirit of Pentecost out into our lives to other people. And again, we are called to be witnesses all the time that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and Savior. Witnesses all the time and everything. I'm about to say something that I couldn't have said in a sermon even a few weeks ago because I hadn't really thought about it and I hadn't really pondered it until Margaret gifted me with a little book by Will Willman. <clears throat> and the book is on the joys and the frustrations and the possibilities and the pitfalls of being a minister and especially being a preacher. The first piece in the book is about words. Words as in the power of words, the possibilities, the risk, the frustrations, the dangers of words, the risk of me standing up here every week and trying to somehow speak and communicate a word of God to you 
within the sometimes ever so small limitations of what even our best words can convey. Willeman writes, I've learned how great a challenge it is to give yourself week after week to so fragile an art. He says we work, meaning preachers, but lay people too. We work chiseling out these sermons from the hard granite of the Bible texts. And then we speak and our words bounce off the walls and ricochet off the ceiling. And then they die, soaked up by pew cushions, or else burrowed deep in people's brains, waiting for the proper time to hatch and to jump you from behind, as they say, preacher, a few weeks ago, didn't you say in the sermon? And then fill in the blank. And then he says, otherwise respectable words like commitment, Stewardship, like witness, like evangelism, have been transmogrified into a sort of a sweet ooze. Use them on Sunday in a sermon and watch the congregation's eyes glaze over. I'm trying to preach for us and to us this morning on Pentecost. And the fact is that you simply cannot be a faithful interpreter of the Pentecost scriptures and the meaning of Pentecost without using what I fear are outworn and, and dulled down and bringing a yawn words. Like witness. Like call. Like mission. Like filled with the spirit. I have no idea, especially since we're not gathered here in the sanctuary this morning. I have no idea how you and how even I react to those words sometimes. Maybe ho hums Maybe sort of a what's it matter? Maybe I, I heard them, but eh. Maybe they're for someone else, but they're not for me. They're not my type. They're not my style of words. Some of you aren't even participating in the worship services until we actually get back there in the sanctuary together. Now, I understand those responses, and at least I'm aware of them, and oftentimes in myself. But those words do matter. And even more, what's behind those words matters. They mean something that's very important. If we're truly the church, if we are truly individual followers of followers of Christ, then they do matter. It matters to understand that we, and I'll repeat that, that we, ever since Pentecost, are spirit-filled people who've been given by God the same power that raised Jesus from death. We've been given power to bring to others, to show others, to teach other people about what we say, about what we do, and about how we live. Those things do matter. Those things like spirit filled, like called to serve Jesus Christ, like mission, like witnessing to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, they do matter. They have to be, at least at some point in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, and we have to go on with them from there. There's no one way and there are not even only a thousand ways to live that. But we always have to be ready for the moment. We always have to be ready for the opportunity. Back in the mid-1980s, Dr. Tom Long was teaching at our Presbyterian Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. And he wrote a little book entitled Shepherds and Bathrobes about episodes with children in church, which are always great to, to hear and great to reflect on. In one place uh, in that book, he tells about a small confirmation class that he was teaching, only three girls in it. And he was teaching about the church seasons and the festivals and so forth. And at one point, he was talking about Pentecost. Reading, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound 
like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. Long got all caught up in the drama and the sounds and the pyrotechnics. And then he became aware that two of the little girls were just listening very carefully and just taking it all in. But the third little girl was looking at him with wide-eyed astonishment. And in a second, she said, gosh, Reverend Long, we must have missed church that Sunday. Reflecting on that a few years later, Tom wrote, because I preach in a university chapel and because you're probably American mainline Protestants, I expect, expect that if you were honest, upon hearing the Spirit's descent in Acts 2, you're like that little girl. I must have missed church that Sunday. One Sunday, he went on to tell a story. A, t a story. One Sunday, he said, about seven years ago, I got a little carried away in a sermon, and I raised my voice, and I waved an arm. And someone in the front row, obviously a first-time visitor, got carried away and shouted, Amen! Right on! Preach it! And I said, he says, I said, it sounds as if someone doesn't really want to be here in a mainline, first-class, respectable university chapel. Ushers, where are you? But the power and the fervor and the amazement and the meaning of Pentecost do matter. And they matter for us respectable and ever so careful and let's not make a fuss Christians. We are called. We are called to witness to what we know and what we believe. I think one of the most beautiful and meaningful hymns in our hymnal, at least for me, is number 322. And you, you heard some of the words reflected in the prayer confession this morning. The hymn is Spirit of the Living God. If we were gathered together here in the sanctuary, if we could yet sing hymns, then we might very well be singing this hymn today. Here's the text. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on thee. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And then we repeat it. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt, mold, fill Use me, use us. There's every good reason that we sing that beautiful hymn today. Because that's what the Holy Spirit intends to do with us. Ever since that first Pentecost. Amen. On this Pentecost Sunday, please join with me in our affirmation of faith as printed in the bulletin. The Holy Spirit is God active in the world. By the Spirit, God raised up leaders and prophets in Israel. By the Spirit, Jesus was conceived, baptized, and empowered. By the Spirit, the risen Christ is present in his church. We affirm that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, the renewer and protector of God's people, the one who makes real in us what God has done for us. The Holy Spirit renews the community of faith. Israel did not cease to become. Yet out of Israel, a new people was formed. The Spirit came with power to the followers of Jesus. Led by the apostles, they began to proclaim in boldness the new thing God had done in Christ. They began to experience in their fellowship a new quality of common life. We believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church can be set on its way again. Even when it seems beyond hope of renewal, 
We are grateful heirs of reformations and reawakenings. We are faithful to the reforms of the past. When we hold ourselves open in the present to the reforming and renewing work of the Spirit. Amen. Let's join together now in the prayers of the people. Holy God and God of holy love, accept now our prayers and shape them to serve your will. Lord, on Pentecost, you filled all believers with your Holy Spirit so that now, even though we don't always know how and what to pray, we trust that you do pray through us, through your Spirit. Join our thoughts and our voices with the faithful all over the world today as we bring to you the needs and the hopes of others. Lord, we fervently pray now, today, on this Pentecost, that you will save and heal our nation and our people from the horrors of injustice and racism. Lord, save us from prejudice and anger and hatred and violence. Save us from despairing that as far as we've come in the relationships between the races, we may be walking backwards now. Lord, save those who are most vulnerable and those who are most likely to be threatened or killed without cause. Father God, in the realities of our world and in the realities of everyday life, give us patience and hope and strength, we pray. When we cannot always hear you or know your will, still give us the faith that endures. Give us the sight and the hearing and the insight to recognize your acts and your voice wherever you act and speak, and give us the grace to then respond with thankfulness and joy. Lord God, sometimes we're so focused on our own lives that we forget that you command us to love every neighbor in the world as you have loved us in Christ. He teaches us that all people are our neighbors and that all people who call on your name will be saved. So take us in prayer and in person to be like Jesus himself to other people in their needs, and especially to those whom Jesus called the least of these my family. Lord, take us to those who need you, even though they don't know their need, so that they may see the love of Christ in us. And we pray that starting today, we will find ways, we will specifically look for ways to show deliberately your love to others and the love of Christ himself for us. We pray that you'll be especially close this morning to bring light and hope to anyone who's terribly ill or anyone who's terribly discouraged or in despair. Be with anyone who is lost in confusion or unfaithfulness or fear or self-destructiveness. And be a hope and a life and a light to those who are dying and those who sit lovingly beside them. We bring all of these prayers and the many other prayers that are in our hearts and minds, we bring them to you in Jesus' name and now together in his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, as we have been doing in these uh, services recently, we come now to the offering. Let your light so shine before other people that they may see your good works and give glory to God who is in heaven. Again, I just continue to encourage you as you're doing so well to bring in your pledges and offerings. Uh, we have, I will add, had some and are having some big and major costly uh, property repairs right now. And our budget is taking that hit. So we may have some special urgency at this point uh, to keep up with our gift. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit go with us 
and with God's people everywhere, now and always. Amen. Thank you.